Good morning and welcome to Security First Baptist. Thank you for joining us. We will be in Genesis chapter 1. Our focus will be verses 1 through 5. And we will be talking about God, the Creator, the All-Powerful, and the All-Good. And uh, we will have some side texts in Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, and 3 through 4. Uh, but go ahead and read Genesis chapter 1. And I want you to circle things in the passage that reveal God's great power and His majesty. And then I want you to write down five difficulties and or struggles that you're having in your life. And on a scale of 1 to 10, how involved do you believe that God is in your circumstances? And how much effect do you think that your belief in God has on those circumstances and why? And so we're going to look at that this morning. And then in a side note, if you've already done that, write down five difficulties or struggles that you have in your life. And we're going to try to build, hopefully by the end of this, build a connection between those two things and God's majesty and my struggles. So we're in Genesis chapter 1, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 5. We good? All right. So in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the depths and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and he called the darkness night. Evening came, and then morning, the first day. All right, so how many things did you come up with in that passage and the rest of the passage that revealed to you God's power and his majesty? So what we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks is different attributes and characteristics of God that make God... God, okay, and so, and how that, his nature and his character are things that we can depend upon in our regular daily lives, okay, so our focus is in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, and so we see in verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, now there's a theological term that we use in Latin, if you know Uh, most of Christian history is through the Catholic Church and for a long time they spoke in in Latin one of the theological terms they use is ex nihilo okay ex nihilo which is Latin for out of nothing and so in the beginning what do we have it's just God there is nothing else there is no universe there wasn't any matter There was no physical laws. There was just God and nothing. And out of that, he created everything. Now, there's uh, an old joke uh, where there was a scientist that went to God and he said, Hey, we've gotten to the point that we can make a man just like you did. And he said, Really? Well, go ahead and try. And so the scientist, he grabbed some dirt. He said, okay, here we go. And God said, wait a minute, that's my dirt. You go make your own. God made us out of nothing. He had nothing to start with. No gene pool, no dirt. He created everything out of nothing. And he didn't do it with his hands. He did it by the word of his mouth. He spoke and it came to be. That's how God works. It's not by might. It's nor by power, but by His Spirit. His Spirit working through His Word. And we can trust in God's Word and in His power in any circumstances that we are in. So what did God create? Okay, He created the visible 
and the invisible creation. The visible and the invisible creation. We see all this in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the Hashmayim and the Adits. Okay? The Hashmayim is in the dual, the dual uh, form of the verb, which means there's two of them. So there's two heavens, and there's the Adits. Okay? So, Brother Reagan, what are you talking about? Well, there's three heavens. Paul mentions it, and we're going to talk about that right now. And that helps us understand what was created. I'm backing up so I can show you. The first heaven, all you got to do is step outside, step out of your car, or just look up. This is the first heaven. Everything that's right channel. Okay, that's good Southeast Texas language right there. Right channel. Everything that you see in this domain is the first heaven. And that's the, the, the part that we're accountable for and stewards of. Is what we see by day, the sky that we see by day. God created that. All the vegetation, if you go through the rest of the passage, see God created everything that's here. It's our inheritance. Fill the earth and subdue it. And, and do what you can. And we do that every day, don't we? We work, we come home, we do what with our, we can let our yard go to get all messy, or we can mow it and clean it and trim it and do all that stuff. But that's what we have and what we're accountable for, that sky by day. Then you have the sky by night, which is beautiful, I think. And so this past week, I spent a lot of time just spending looking at the stars, looking at the nature, and I, I suggest that you do that. Every day you need a time where you look at the majesty of God in His greatness. You see that especially at night or early mornings by looking at the stars. That's the universe. God set all that stuff in in place so that we could tell what time of year it was, so that we could see things and understand the constellations, the seasons, and all those different things. That's the things that God set into place. And that's the visible creation that we see. But heaven is dual form. There's two of them. And so then they're beyond what we see is what is unseen. And that's the place where God and this heavenly spiritual beings dwell. And that's kind of weird, and we won't get totally into it today. But that's where he is, okay? And where he dwells. And it intertwines and intertangles with the world that we live in, where he can just come in and out of us, this part as he wishes. We see all this happening here. And what does it reveal to us? Well, we're going to go three more theological terms here. Some of you may have heard it. Some of it may be new to you. The three O's, God's omnipotence, which is a big word for saying God's all-powerful. He had the power to create things by the sound of His voice. His omniscience, or, or His, His all-knowledge. Have you ever tried to make something out of something that just a pile of nothing? you got to have some clue, like this church building. If you try to build the building, you have to have a little bit of a clue of what you're doing. Square corners, what's plumb, and different things, and that goes with everything. You ever tried to build a car? You gotta have some type of knowledge. Imagine trying to build from nothing the human body. How to make from nothing the laws of the tides and the ocean. And do that in six days. <laughs> God's knowledge is demonstrated by everything that we see. Things that took us millennia to discover, he did in a moment. The laws of gravity, the laws of forces and motions, all those things he created to create balance and to create the world that we live in. But the beautiful thing here is the last O is his omnipresence. That God is present everywhere at all times. And because he's everywhere, at all times, he was able to be personally involved. We see that the, the earth was formless, it was empty, and all that means is that it had no shape and there's nothing in it, okay? And God's spirit was hovering over the waters. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a location of that water where God wasn't. And in everything that happened on, that, on those six days, he was intimately involved. And guess what? He wasn't just that way for six days. He's still that way now. God is intimately involved with his creation. We'll get more into that in a minute. 
So God has the authority to create and change things according to his will and his pleasure. And not just in those six days, but today. He can do that now. Anything he wants to do, he has the authority and the presence to change it. When you think you're alone and you're in bad circumstances, you're not. God's present, and he is able to will and to act in any way that he pleases. <laughs> okay? Isaiah 46, 8 through 10 reads this. Remember this and be brave. Take it to heart, you transgressors. Remember what happened long ago. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and no one is like me. I declare the end from the beginning, and from long ago, what is not yet dead, saying, my plan will take place, and I will do all my will. There is nothing that catches God off guard. He's not unaware of what's going on in the presidency, and if he wanted to, he could tell you who wins. <laughs> he wasn't caught off guard by coven, and he can tell you the next couple of viruses going to come around the next decade or so. He can tell you anything's going to happen. Nothing catches him off guard, and he's completely present in the midst of it. If he has control over it, nothing is out of his plan or his will. All right. So creation reveals that God is all-powerful. It reveals to us that nothing is beyond his control. He is in absolute charge. Regardless of what we do, regardless of anything else, he is all-powerful. But creation reveals to us something else. It reveals to us that God is all good. He is all good. He is holy and completely good. Okay? And so God said, let there be light. There is light. So he separates. Okay? He looks at that light and he said, ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. Okay, what does that mean? What is good? Okay, the word there in the Hebrew is tov. It's to be pleasant. It's to be agreeable. Okay, it's to be good. You ever sit down in a chair? It just wasn't right. So you got to move a little bit. Or you lay down in bed and you get on your pillow and the pillow's not right. So you, you got to push a little bit. Or, you, or you're hanging something up and you look at it and it ain't right. So you got to move a little bit over here. You got to change that over there. And, and then it finally gets, oh, okay. That, yeah, there. I like that. That's the word good. It's what God is pleased with. It's what's pleasant, it's agreeable. And not only is it agreeable to him, it is agreeable all the way around. See, the way that God created, when he said it was good, that everything in creation was for the benefit of man and works in harmony to provide for all the creatures of the earth. So when God created vegetation, it wasn't that the vegetation in itself was good, but it was good in the provision for the animals that would come behind and eat it, including us. And that it would provide the oxygen. And all that happened that we are slowly starting to come to understand. All of that happened in the moment when God spoke into existence. He said, that's great. And so everything that God created is good. Now let me help you understand that. There's nothing in God's creation that he created to trick us, to cause us to stumble. He didn't say, well, I'm just going to give you oxygen for six days, but then on the seventh day, I'm going to take it all away from you and not let the, oxygen, the plants produce. No, that's mean. And God's not that way. God's good. Everything that he created is pleasant and agreeable to everything. There's nothing hidden. He's not trying to be sneaky. Everything that he's done, he's done in the opening. He's done it from the beginning. He has nothing to hide. And in essence, when we see that, we see the epitome and the example of what is good. If you're looking for something good, you need only go to God. <laughs> and now I'm going to harp on it. God is actively present and part of his creation. As you look through all of Genesis 1, there is never a moment where God is not present. 
there is never a moment where God just kind of winds things up and lets it go. God is actively involved, and it is His Spirit that brings life to everything. It is His Spirit that gives life in the creature's lungs. It is His Spirit that gives life to man. He is, he is actively at work to cause everything to be alive. He is, if he were to separate himself from the earth, that'd be bad. That'd be bad. He is active in everything, okay? At no point does God leave creation on its own. He uses his authority for the benefit of what he has made. Now, there was one point in creation, as we look in Genesis chapter 2, that God said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 tie up. Man being by himself, that ain't good. And so he used his authority on that day to create a woman and to create culture and society. God, in, in the midst of a circumstance that isn't pleasant, God is at work to make it good. Paul said it this way, all things are together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God is at work for what is good. And he, he is actively present to accomplish it. Okay? Isaiah 46 says it like this. Listen to me, in verse 3 and 4. Listen to me, house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been sustained from the womb, carried along since birth. I will be the same until your old age, and I will bear you up when you turn gray. I have made you, and I will carry you. I will bear and save you. That doesn't sound like a God that watches from a distance. It doesn't sound like a God who is not active in his creation. He knows us. So in the beginning, I asked you all to write down five difficulties or struggles in your life. And on a scale of one to ten, how involved do you believe God is in your circumstances? Do you have trouble? Do you see circumstances where people are selfish? Where people ignore God and do their own thing? You don't have to go far to find that, do you? Do you really believe that God is not involved in those circumstances? Do you think that because we ignore God and turn our backs on Him that He just says, well, fine, I'll just leave you all alone? No. <laughs> no, He doesn't do that. God doesn't ignore the problems in our life. In fact, He's actively involved. And even when we rebel, He is the one that has to bear that offense. And if you question that, just go look at the cross. He took on our, our iniquities. He bore the shame of them. Whether we confess him as salvation or not, he bore all sins, even those that rejected him in complete rebellion. He took those and bore those as well. Even if he knew they weren't going to repent, he took on all mankind's sin. Why? So that all could come to repentance. So all could have opportunity of salvation. He said, look, I'm bearing you. Before you knew how to speak, before you could walk, I knew you. And I sustained you. And when you grew older and you thought you were on your own, I was with you. Even when you rejected me, I was around you. And when you get old, and when you turn gray and are helpless again, I will again bear you up. I will sustain you. I will watch over you. God is the creator God who is all-powerful. He is able to do anything that he wants. But his favorite thing to do is to be good and good to his people. We can look at our circumstances and look at the glass half empty. All week, people have been saying, oh, 2020, it just keeps going. We get the virus, and once the virus, it will start seeing a little light at the end of the tunnel. Here comes two hurricanes. <laughs> right? But God is still good. Jesus said it best. He said, look, 
I'm not going to lie to you. In this world, you're going to have trouble. That was one of the last things Jesus said, isn't it? In this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome it. And the last thing he said is, listen, I'm going to be with you. I, I'm not leaving you as orphans. You're not in this alone. I died to save you and redeem you, but I res res resurrected, there's the word, <laughs> to justify you, to bring you into a relationship so I could be more active in your life by getting inside you and living through you so that you can experience a whole new life the way I intended it to be with me. Look, we are not defeated. Even if death comes, we will be resurrected. We will be taken into the next stage. This is not the end. God is all-powerful, and God is good. You can take that to the bank. You can depend on that. In all the world and all its troubles, that is not God. <laughs> that is not the end of the story. And so in the midst of hopeless circumstances, we have hope beyond hope. Even as Abraham, who was 100 years, and God said, hey, you're going to have a kid. He didn't put his hope in his body. He put his hope in the Word of God. And it came about. So as we look at difficult circumstances, whether it be our nation, whether it be our, our finances, whether, whatever it may be, there is a God that's all-powerful, and there is a God that is good. And we need only turn to him and look to him, and he will give us hope. And he will, even if we have to walk through that valley, we don't have to walk it alone. He has promised to go with us. And you may be looking this morning and said, Man, I wish he would. But well, it's real simple. But when we come in front of God, that, that's the first, when we come to God, the first thing that we encounter is ourselves. It is not that. God is pushing me away. It's more than I'm running from him. That's how I was before I met him. Right, because I was ashamed of myself, ashamed of my sin. But when Jesus died on the cross, he bore that sin for us so that we could come into relationship with him, no longer counting our sins against us. Maybe that's something you need to receive today. Just bow your head and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. But I trust the work that you did in Jesus and I ask you to forgive me to come into my life and make me new. Simple prayer like that. God listens to it. Genuine prayer. You enter into that relationship. But that doesn't make life easier, does it? But it does give us someone that we can walk with and a God that has all power and all authority to work in our circumstances. Do you think that God is involved? Look at our community. And we see sin and we see death and we see these things. Can God work in our community? Can God reach a post-Christian culture with the gospel? Of course he can. He's been doing that forever. The question is not what can God do. What are we willing to allow God to do in and through us? It's not that God is unable to work here. Do we believe that God is able, willing, and will work as we put our feet to the effort? We serve an all-powerful and an all-good God. Do you know him? Do you believe that in your circumstances? I'm here to encourage you today. God sees what's going on. And he's able to make it right. Ask him to do so. And follow him. Trust him. He's good like that. He'll take care of you. May not be today. But it's coming. He will take care of you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your kindness. 
thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that regardless of the way that we are and the way that we can be, that you are faithful. For Lord, you didn't die for the righteous, you died for the ungodly. For while we were still sinners, you died. You demonstrated your love for us, not at our best, but at our worst. For Lord, you are good. You knew us before we were made. You knew the day we would be born and the day that we would pass. So Lord, help us to trust you for all the stuff in between. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our prayer for you today is that you would walk closer with God this week. Take some time to spend with the Lord. I know playoffs are going on today. And maybe you got a busy day. Take five minutes to sit outside or maybe in the shade and just watch the birds eat or sing. Look at the clouds go by. Remember God's goodness and his faithfulness to you. So that when you go to work Monday morning, so that when things start happening on Monday, you remember that God on Sunday is the God on Monday. And he'll be faithful to provide for you then. Chloe!